Tom Quiggin and um, David Richardson. Um, th this is the second event in our autumn series on privatisation, which has been put on by the Victorian branch of Australian Fabians. My name is Jeff McCracken Hughes, and I'm the acting chair of the branch. Now, in the spirit of reconciliation, Australian Fabians acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Now, this is the second event of our series. In the first event, we looked at the privatisation of services such as particularly security and aged care, which have been much in the news recently, but also other things like prisons and so on. Um, and in this second event, we are putting the spotlight on infrastructure and utilities, which I think are really where the privatisation story started. And it still seems to be going pretty strong, <laughs> contrary to many people's expectations. Uh, I think that many of us are baffled at the continuing strength uh, of this policy direction. That has, has never had popular support, um, that most people believe it has delivered nothing but the, the replacement of productive workers by an army of marketeers, salespeople, lobbyists, and so on. Uh, the main results of which have seemed to many people to be rising prices and rising rising profit for the private sector. And um, this has put more and more money into the hands of business interests that increasingly control our economy and our politics and our lives. So what we are hoping um, to get some more insight in tonight is um, how has privatization succeeded for so long? Um, may have its results really been as bad as probably most of us on this call believe they have been, uh, have it, has, it, has its successes that we've underestimated, um, and what are the prospects of the tide turning, um, and how might that happen? And to help us with these questions tonight, we have two outstanding thinkers uh, on the subject of privatisation in Australia with John Quiggin uh, and David Richardson. I, uh, uh, introduce them in more details as they come to speak. Just to let you know, uh, we'll be taking questions from our speakers via Zoom chat, which is the normal thing that we do. Um, and you can submit chats at any time, and we will attempt to pick out questioners who uh, reflect the main themes that emerge in the chat. And after the formal meeting tonight, again, it's the usual thing that we do in Fabian's Victoria which is that you're all invited to get yourself a drink and some nibbles and join us in the online pub where some really interesting conversation very often happens. Um, so we'll give you more details on that when we get to it. So our first speaker tonight is John Quiggin. John is a frequent and valued contributor to Fabian's. I'm really, really pleased and honored that he is giving us some more of his time tonight. Um, He's a leading authority, uh, possibly the leading authority uh, on privatisation in Australia. He is Professor of Economics at the University of Queensland. Um, he's written extensively uh, and spoken extensively on privatisation. Um, his most recent book is Economics in Two Lessons, Why Markets Work So Well and Why They Can Fail So Badly. Uh, which was published in 2019. And I think there's another book in the works, John. I'm not sure the details of that. Anyway, um, welcome, John. And, 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 and we, we were looking forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Jeff. And thanks for inviting me to talk to Fabians. And um, I'll acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Lanthew Jagger, people. You can see a little bit of it behind me on the, on the screen there. Um, I'll start by observing that, uh, as my book indicates, so I, I'm a believer in a mixed economy. I believe there's a substantial role for markets and also a substantial role for, uh, uh, for state action. And if you believe that, uh, then you can't be either for or against privatisation. Uh, 
in, in its, its end. That is, uh, in a mixed economy, there are things that are more appropriately done by governments, things that are more appropriately done by the private sector. Some things, perhaps, by some sort of combination of the two, a public-private partnership, uh, and those things are likely to change over time. So that um, some things which were once done by governments uh, may be turned over to the private sector and vice versa. Uh, electricity net was originally provided by the private sector or by local government, uh, then uh, they're nationalised, then largely privatised. Uh, we can. I'll talk a bit more about which of those made sense, but, but very clearly those things changed according to perceptions of what was needed. Uh, so, so when we talk about privatisation, we're really talking about a belief starting around 1980 or so uh, that uh, the balance between the state and the market had shifted too far in favour of the state, that we should uh, very substantially reduce the role of the public sector in a range of activities uh, starting with um, starting with infrastructure, which is our subject tonight. So, um, so uh, I'll then say I'm actually much more optimistic on this than Jeff. In my view, the tide has well and truly turned on. Yeah, turn, 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 turn I'm sorry. I'm. Um, I have. Was that one to mute? Uh, yeah. Um, so um, the tide, in my view, has well and truly turned on privatisation. Uh, and particularly on some of the most uh, seemingly appealing aspects of it, like public-private partnerships. Uh, so if we uh, look at the history of these things, although there have been privatisations and nationalisations occurring since time immemorial, uh, in the Australian context, we can regard this, uh, this movement as largely imported from the United Kingdom and the Thatcher government. It was the, it was the Thatcher government that embarked on the first large-scale and systematic privatisation of public enterprise in the UK. Uh, and um, that was clearly the model adopted by uh, the reformers of the 1980s, Hawke, Keating, Howard, and so forth, when they, uh, when they advocated privatisation. The um, uh, Conservative governments also were largely responsible for what they called the private finance initiative, what's typically called in Australia, public-private partnerships. Uh, of those things, what we've seen in the UK is the complete abandonment of the private finance initiative. I'll, I'll come back to that in a little while, but, um, uh, but this was a policy which uh, formed the model, uh, very close, very closely copied by uh, a number of Australian governments. Uh, in its original version, it failed. The Conservatives tried to reboot it with so-called PFI2, have abandoned that completely. So, uh, uh, and what we've seen in Australia is that most state governments have backed away from uh, particularly the classic model of, of PPPs. Uh, looking at privatisation uh, in the more traditional sense of selling off of whole government enterprises, I, again, uh, I would say that um, our process was at its most rapid in the 1990s uh, and from about 2005 or so onwards has been, um, uh, has been as much reversed as, as repeated. And so we've seen uh, various, uh, uh, various PPP and other arrangements taken back into full public ownership. We've also seen areas like telecommunications and, uh, and energy, governments getting back into a sphere which they previously abandoned. So uh, I'm talking you, to you uh, courtesy of the NBN, uh, a public enterprise which was created because the privatised Telstra uh, which in the past would have done that, failed to do its job, failed to do the job which was expected of it. Uh, that was an incredibly costly process. If we kept children in public ownership, we would have saved all that money, uh, but that's what's happened. Uh, we are also seeing uh, in the energy sector, uh, governments which had vacated that field in South Australia, um, re-entering it with, with uh, contracts for batteries, gas power, gas fired power plants and so forth. Uh, the federal government in a very chaotic sort of way, uh, getting back into the, getting into the energy sphere with Snowy 2 and with various kinds of, of schemes to get involved. So what, what we've seen, uh, terms of what we've seen as the picture is, is that, uh, is that in most places, uh, the, uh, PPP model, who after it's tried for a while, has failed and has been reversed. And that's, that's I think, largely the case in, in Australia. 
with the partial exception of Victoria. And so um, and if we look at some of the disasters that have occurred during the, uh, during the pandemic, at least some of those, I think, reflect the fact that Victorian governments of both uh, political persuasions are much more reflexively attached to uh, public-private partnerships than are governments of any political persuasion in, in other states. Uh, so having said those things, what was the appeal of privatisation and PPPs and why is it failed? Well, there are uh, two elements to it. The intellectually respectable element is a belief that um, with the appropriate regulation, uh, a private enterprise can do the job of uh, providing infrastructure services more cost effectively than public enterprise. And further, uh, at least initially, a belief that most of this regulation, in fact, wasn't necessary in the long term, that with clever market design, we could replace public sector monopolies with uh, uh, competitive private industries. And so, um, uh, so that was the intellectually respectable part of the case, occurring at a time in the 1980s of, uh, in 1990s of peak faith in markets in general. And uh, that faith has declined both because of the failures of of private enterprise, of privatised utilities that Jeff referred to, but also because of the broader failures of the private sector reflected in things like the global financial crisis, reflected in the need to bail out the whole private sector in the context of the pandemic. Uh, so as, as uh, Jeff observes, uh, uh, observed, he took a fair bit of my stuff already. If we look at the question, why did people think that the private sector would do a better job? A large part of it was the idea of feather bedding and so forth, that, that the private sector, the public sector enterprises had built up large unionised workforces uh, who didn't really have to do very much and were overpaid and that, that private sector discipline would drive those costs down. Uh, that was true to some extent, though of course in many cases driven down too far. Um, in um, many cases, those uh, uh, the workers who were uh, dispensed with had to be rehired when the systems failed uh, because uh, uh, the cuts had gone too deep. And of course, uh, almost all those benefits have been offset by uh, large expenses incurred in marketing management and so forth. So that um, uh, so that the overall cost efficiency of the uh, privatised enterprises in general uh, hasn't realised the kind of gains that that we hoped for. Uh, and um, especially when you add the further cost of uh, a, a large amount of regulation imposed on them, and then um, uh, the fleets of, of lawyers and lobbyists that the private enterprises employ to get the best possible deal out of the regulators. That process, again, uh, having been an electricity regulator myself, uh, the resources employed in that process would have paid for a lot of uh, electricians and um, uh, maintenance workers and, and other people whose jobs were uh, jobs were dispensed with in the process. So that that case, though, at least has some uh, some coherence to it, and we can imagine going back and forth. There, there certainly you can certainly look at the electricity sector and say, on the generation side, uh, with the with the advent of, of renewables, uh, the case for uh, a, a unified public sector monopoly in that sphere is a lot, lot weaker. That we could look uh, look at a much more uh, mixed sort of approach to electricity generation. On the other hand, um, on the other hand, uh, what we've seen has been very large increases in the cost of uh, in the cost of electricity transmission and distribution associated with the high rates of return demanded by by the private sector, and then a, an incredibly wasteful uh, exercise in retail competition, which has really generated uh, no net benefits and has, has substantially increased costs. So this is. To, to go into the details of all of these things, we'd need to look very closely at um, at the specifics of particular industries and see which one, where, where uh, starting from a position of public, complete public ownership, uh, we will want to introduce more private sector, but also looking at uh, infrastructure type services that have traditionally been provided by the private sector and considering whether the public uh, should get more involved. Uh, that's an argument really for economists at the micro level, if we ask why was this policy so appealing, it wasn't because economists, because politicians were suddenly convinced that um, about the evils of feather bedding or any of that sort of stuff. It was because it appeared to be uh, first a way of getting easy money that could be spent on uh, spent on whatever people want, whatever governments wanted to do. 
at a time when they were uh, particularly strapped for cash. And second, uh, uh, given that they were, they were constrained in what they could spend on capital, a way of creatively financing necessary infrastructure in such a way that it didn't need to be paid for. Um, now, uh, uh, the most famous of free market economists, Milton Friedman, was very fond of saying uh, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And fairly clearly, uh, and popular wisdom to anybody uh, displaying great foolishness says, uh, well, look, if you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. Uh, so when we look at the politicians who sign contracts, for example, the Sydney Harbour Tunnel, uh, various bridges and so forth, uh, appearing to get those things for nothing, uh, they are in the position of the sucker who buys the Brooklyn Bridge or the person going to a pub in the US in the 19th century who really believes that the free lunch they're being served is free uh, and not paid for in the price of the beer that they're drinking. Uh, these, uh, uh, these deals are paid for uh, one way or another by the public. I mean, sometimes through tolls, sometimes through various, um, uh, various factual arrangements. Uh, but the effect is that, uh, uh, the effect is that there is no net saving uh, to the public uh, from this kind of, uh, uh, from this kind of deal. Um, and uh, that's what's eventually led to the collapse of, of the PPP market. So we can really see public-private partnerships in, in three stages. The, the, first was, um, the first was the one I've described where uh, uh, politicians who wanted to get some piece of infrastructure built didn't want to get it past treasuries or extremely reluctant finance stuff, uh, would cook up one of these deals uh, on very unfavorable terms to the public, but in an accounting way that made it look as if we were getting something for nothing and, uh, and, and implement the deals. Uh, over time, state auditors general got wise to this um, and said, yeah, these aren't genuine transactions. You're not actually uh, getting hands over the private sector. All you're doing is making time payments in a deceptive way, you have to take these back on the books and add them to public debt. Uh, and a second stage though was uh, business people have been making out like bandits on this stuff and politicians have been keen to make it work so that when something went wrong, they were typically bailed out. We had a second period when uh, the losses were actually, the boot was actually on the other foot to some extent. Uh, business people were very keen to do these deals. Most of them were planning to walk away long before the deal was finished with a pot of money. And so they found consultants to say, this is going to be incredibly profitable. The deal went ahead, uh, but by this stage, the government was much less willing to bail people out. You've got things like the Cross uh, Cross City Tunnel in, in, and Lane Cove Tunnel in Sydney, uh, where, the, um, uh, where the private sector was the one that mostly did their dough. Uh, once you have neither party willing to take a big loss, uh, the answer is uh, there is a net loss in these deals because uh, uh, for two reasons. One is that the capital is more expensive because we're, we're using private sector capital uh, for something that could be financed using low interest government bonds. And the second is that the allocation of risk is all wrong. If you want to get the debt off the books, you have to transfer demand risk to the private sector. But that makes no sense at all in a typical public infrastructure project. If we ask uh, what's going to determine how many people use, uh, use this piece of infrastructure, it's not going to depend at all on the quality of the management, whether the toll, toll collectors in the days when we had toll collectors smile or not. It's not going to depend very much even on the quality of the infrastructure. It's going to depend on uh, it's going to depend on a whole series of government decisions which influence how much. If it's a road, how many people are at one end of the road and want to get to the other is determined almost entirely by government. If you try and get a private firm to take that risk, uh, they'll demand extortionate rates of return, as Macquarie Bank, the leading practitioner of this stuff, has historically done. And that's why we've seen uh, the Senate's deals become uh, less and less feasible. Uh, the breaking point here was really the global financial crisis that, uh, that uh, put private sector firms on, on notice that uh, putting, cooking up some kind of bogus case uh, that made it look good uh, wouldn't fly nearly as well with capital markets as it had in the years before the global financial crisis. And so we saw a big drop off in the PPP market um, over that time. 
Uh, so that's, I think, what's happened with PPPs. I'll just check my time. Coming to privatization, we haven't seen, or we should have, uh, any kind of systematic reversal of, of the nationalizations that have taken place. What we've seen rather is, uh, as it's become evident that there isn't really a gain from privatization, as the public has become more and more resistant to it, uh, we've seen less privatizations and we've seen more ad hoc government interventions of the kind of the NBN, where uh, the right government didn't come to power with a view that privatization was a bad, bad policy and we should reverse it. They came with a view that we needed national broadband network and we couldn't get it out of Telstra. So at least in theory, we'll build the thing ourselves, then, then sell the asset later. So they were still, uh, still in this belief that we would get out of public ownership sooner or later. And that's true of most of the ad hoc interventions we've seen. The governments uh, still haven't systematically bought into the idea that uh, they should be uh, they should actually be owning one of these things. It's just that uh, things don't work out the way they should and the constraints now on getting in and doing it one way or another are much less than, much less than they used to be. Uh, and so that's, that's been, happening, uh, been happening all around the world. But going back to the UK, we've seen uh, the last big privatisation in the UK was, was the railways. And that's uh, been gradually unwound over, over uh, 20 or more years, first with the um, uh, first with the rail network going back into effect with public ownership, and then with the um, uh, then with the various contracts of rail operators effectively being renegotiated in ways that come much closer to uh, public ownership than before. Uh, so we've um, uh, so what we've seen, uh, I think, it is uh, a gradual move towards a more to, back towards the views that, that prevailed before the um, before the before the era of privatization, but without much systematic rethinking. What's happened, roughly speaking, is the people who really believed in privatization, uh, typically people of my age and older, um, uh, they were the ones who were around doing this stuff in the 80s and 90s. As they move on from the scene, you get people who have never really known anything different, but equally don't have any great faith in in the outcomes of privatization because it's never really worked, worked very well for them. Uh, what we need uh, coming out of the pandemic uh, and what we're seeing in some places, though not in Australia, uh, is an acceptance that the role of government in providing basic infrastructure is central and that, um, and that uh, we need to have a systematic reconsideration of the roles of the public and um, uh, the public and private, private sectors. And uh, and that I think uh, is gradually coming to be coming to be realised, uh, but we're still I think all right. So I'd say summing up, my view is not that this stuff is still popular or even in the political class. Uh, it's rather that uh, there's been they can't really remember anything different, and so the instinct, the instinct, the warring instincts are on the one hand, this is the way we've always done things in the memory of somebody who's only been uh, to be active in the last 30 years. On the other hand, uh, this doesn't seem to be working very well and we should do something about it. Uh, what I think as uh, Fabian Socialists we should be doing is restating and redeveloping a systematic case for a mixed economy in which both the public and private sectors play a role. Uh, thanks, that, that will, that's I think my 20 minutes, so I'll, um, I'll turn over to you. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's a terrific um, summary, um, as we'd expect from you, John. And, um, very interesting, and I, I think there's going to be a lot of um, questions and discussion that will arise out of that. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll keep our um, powder dry on that until we've heard um, until we've heard from David. Um, so David's got a great act to follow, um, and I'm sure he's going to do extremely well. Um, uh, so David is, uh, Richardson uh, is a senior research fellow at the Australia Institute. He has taught economics uh, at the University of New England and the University of Western Australia. And um, his research interests include macroeconomics and international economics. And uh, close to the, on the subject that we're talking about um, this evening, uh, he, he was author quite recently 
um, of, of a publication called The Costs of Market Experiments. Electricity consumers pay the price for competition, privatization, corporatization, corporatization and marketization. So uh, I think we're getting an idea of where your mind is at, David. Uh, um, uh, welcome very much to our meeting and we're very much looking forward to um, hearing your contribution to the debate. Well, thanks very much for that introduction. <coughs> um, <clears throat> I'm going to concentrate on electricity because, um, as you mentioned, we've done a fair bit of work in, in this area. And um, it, it's a good example of uh, you know, the, the selling off of a monopoly business and generates a lot of the lessons that we should be learning from these privatization experiments. Uh, it's interesting to note that um, <clears throat> electricity privatization started a bit later than the others. Uh, it was never on top of anyone's list, but um, yeah, eventually <clears throat> free marketeers thought that uh, it's something that could be successfully privatized. And we saw Kenneth, for example, uh, <clears throat> kicking the process off in a big way in the mid 1990s. <clears throat> the federal government uh, introduced a competition agenda at about the same time, which su suggested state government uh, utilities should emulate the private sector and charge basically the same sorts of, of rates as uh, <clears throat> their peers in the private sector. Uh, sorry, and sort of generate similar returns on capital. Um, <clears throat> and electricity is important too. Uh, <clears throat> you have to be pretty well off in Australia, I think, to not notice the cost of electricity in your household budget. Um, <clears throat> when we look at the distribution of income in Australia and uh, the impact of recent prices, well, actually, let's, let's first talk about those prices. From about 1980 to 2000, uh, electricity prices roughly moved in line with inflation, uh, a little bit more, but there wasn't much in it. But by about 2017, electricity prices had doubled relative to inflation. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, instead of being one-to-one, -one, uh, if you base things around 2000, uh, <clears throat> the price of electricity was double the CPI uh, by 2017. Now that's moderated slightly, but it's still about 77% higher than what it should have been if it had kept pace with inflation itself. And I mentioned the distribution of income and the impact of uh, electricity when we look at the bottom 20% of households in Australia, they spend just over 6% of their income on fuel and power. And for a lot of them, a lot of them, fuel and power is electricity only. So one in every 13 weeks, your household budget disappears on electricity. Some <clears throat> uh, you know, fairly very important for low income households. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, something we shouldn't be playing with lightly, you would think. By comparison, the top 20% of households spend just over 1% of their income on fuel and power. And uh, it's interesting when you look at the stats, a lot of that is fuel and power for second houses and things like that. Uh, so it's not exactly like with like. Um, so 
Yeah, we can regard the effect of privatisation, uh, increasing prices, uh, the figures hint that the price increases followed privatisation. Uh, we've got a bit more evidence to back that up that I'll try and get to later on, but uh, <clears throat> but what what's happening is that privatisation becomes a mechanism for redistributing income away from consumers to the rich. And uh, <clears throat> what I've done is had a, had a look at the, uh, the books of some of the electricity companies. Uh, there's three main ones in Australia, AGL Origin and Energy Australia. Um, <clears throat> as it happens, AGL discloses a lot more information. So uh, it's useful to play around with their figures. And uh, their latest annual report shows that they made a pre-tax profit of 1.4 billion on assets of 8.1 billion. So that's a rate of return in fairly difficult times of 18%, which is uh, <clears throat> a hell of a lot better than anyone can get through bank accounts and that sort of stuff. Now, <clears throat> that asset base is interesting. It's um, quite inflated by goodwill of 2.9 billion. And um, <clears throat> this essentially is part of the costs of privatization. Um, <clears throat> hopefully I'll be able to get into a bit more detail later. But, but basically what happened is AGL has paid more than the book value of uh, the assets that it bought under privatization. And as John, John explained, this is one of the attractions for state governments that uh, they can get a huge pot of money by selling off their assets at um, you know, much more than it costs to replace them. Uh, but <clears throat> by paying more than the value of the assets you receive, uh, <clears throat> that would mean that you'd have to declare a loss, except that you can describe the difference as goodwill and put that on your books. And uh, <clears throat> that gives you an inflated capital base. Uh, and it has the cosmetics too of making your profit look a little bit more modest. Uh, <clears throat> and, and also having that inflated capital base was handy at, at, during the periods when uh, <clears throat> state governments were still regulating the retail price of electricity. Uh, and as you can imagine, without uh, that goodwill, the, um, <clears throat> the return on that part of the asset base that's critical to make electricity uh, is a hell of a lot higher. Um, <clears throat> and you know, as a commercial thing, uh, companies like AGL uh, enjoying huge profits anyway, but <clears throat> things like having to pay over the odds for the, the businesses they bought on privatization, that puts a flaw under <clears throat> uh, the amount uh, that they're always going to charge. Um, and so when we look at that part of AGL that specifically sells electricity to consumer customers, that's their term to distinguish ordinary punters like us from business customers. So for that, that business, 
their revenue is just over four billion. Their network and other costs, and uh, you know, all the poles and wires, all that sort of stuff, is one point seven billion. And fuel costs, uh, <clears throat> just a bit over three hundred million. So <clears throat> that's really interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, <clears throat> how often do we hear the electricity companies explain that they have to charge these massive prices uh, because something's happened to increase their fuel costs. Uh, but on these figures, fuel costs are some 7% of what the actual consumer customer pays. And I've checked this by going through the input output tables and when we do those calculations, we also confirm that fuel costs are around 7% of the final price. Now, <clears throat> uh, hopefully, of course, one day we get to zero as fuel costs uh, when we get rid of fossil fuels altogether. Uh, but in, at the moment, when they're still contributing something like 75, 80% of all electricity. Uh, they're getting the blame whenever the, whenever the big companies uh, <clears throat> feel like making extra profits. Um, <clears throat> and when you buy from AGL, uh, from those figures, they take roughly 50% of your electricity bill the rest, uh, as we said, goes to um, uh, the poles and wire people, the network and distribution, uh, sorry, the network, the transmission and distribution sectors, uh, as well as the generators. All AGL does for this little bit, uh, for the retail sector that we're talking about, all they do is operate the billing system but being the last ones to face the customer, they're in the position where they can uh, charge you around 50% of the bill. Uh, <clears throat> their annual report also gave a figure for the amount consumer customers paid on average compared with business customers. And uh, so, the average consumer customer paid $395.60 per megawatt hour, uh, while large businesses paid $172.60. So that's a 71% premium paid by consumers or um, uh, 123 per megawatt hour. Megawatt hour mightn't mean much, but if you divide by a thousand, you probably recognize that perhaps when you look at your electricity bill and see the charge given as uh, per kilowatt hour. And <clears throat> uh, the figures in the, uh, that AGL gives too, suggest that uh, perhaps half the difference can be explained by higher network costs for the retail investors. Uh, <clears throat> but that still leaves a consumer ripoff rip of around $57 per megawatt hour on top of what they charge businesses generally. And um, you know, they're, they're not making losses on that either. So, <clears throat> If your annual electricity bill is about 1400 per annum, something like 700 goes directly to AGL. And um, <clears throat> uh, now John briefly mentioned some of the additional costs associated with privatization in terms of um, all the additional salespeople and whatnot. Um, I might get into some more detail on that because we've looked fairly closely at some of those things. 
But in AGL's annual report, we noticed that uh, there's an average $96 per customer in what they call costs related to acquiring and retaining customers. Um, you and I would know that better as sales and marketing. Um, <clears throat> uh, now, I mentioned goodwill um, as the premium that uh, the companies have paid to buy assets from the public sector. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, if we like, we can discuss that some more in question time. Uh, but there's another thing to notice too. Um, <clears throat> uh, in other ways, the electricity companies, including the government owned ones in uh, transmission and distribution, have um, invented all sorts of uh, creative ways of inflating their asset base uh, and so inflating um, <clears throat> uh, their, their capital value. Um, <clears throat> these, these were raised in, in the audit report, in AGL's audit report, as key audit matters. Now, Key audit matters is something that auditors raise when they don't want to say that they can't endorse the company's report, but they would like to draw to your attention things that you might disagree with. And uh, <clears throat> if you made up your own mind, you might, for example, have a much lower capital value imputed to the company concerned. And uh, this arises in the value uh, that AGL declares as the carrying value of plant and equipment, uh, <clears throat> which uh, <clears throat> when you read the description, looks like, you know, in part, it's the capitalized value of the future monopoly profits that they're expecting. Uh, <clears throat> now, AGL are not alone in this, and an amazing one that um, uh, always <laughs> concerns me is Sydney Airport. When you look at Sydney Airport, uh, <clears throat> their total equity is uh, about $1 billion, but included in their total assets is 5.6 billion, uh, which is their valuation of what they call their airport operator license. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, this has to be a very, very shunky thing. Anyway, to continue with um, <clears throat> Uh, electricity, when we look at some of the real, real costs, uh, <clears throat> a lot of the final price is, uh, <clears throat> is clearly uh, excess profit for AGL. Uh, but <clears throat> I'll go back a step. Um, the Productivity Commission a few years ago did a study into electricity and why the productivity was so important, uh, was so, so low. In fact, negative productivity in the electricity sector. And uh, <clears throat> there's all sorts of things they decided to pick on to blame, including you know, the costs of green regulation and all those sorts of things. Uh, and I, but I asked one of the authors, um, so, you know, did you look closely at labour productivity? And yeah, of course we did. Uh, well, okay, who works there? How, how would you describe their workforce? And that's something they 
never occur to them to look at. We just assume that companies are efficient and will hire the labor force that gives them best value for buck. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we asked the ABS to give us some uh, <clears throat> unreleased data and we were able to put some figures together that seemed quite astonishing. So overall, the electricity workforce between November 96 and November 2016 increased by 20 percent, uh, sorry, 47 percent. Now, <clears throat> within that, managers increased by 217%. And uh, we suspect that the main thing going on there is that uh, as you break up the electricity sector into smaller units, uh, <clears throat> some horizontally, you're trying to feign competition between different retailers and some vertically you're splitting electricity off from transmission, from distribution and from retail. Uh, <clears throat> there's so many, so much more work for, for managers. Every, every one of these little uh, electricity companies needs their own HR department, all that sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> and I think I've got the figures here. Uh, 20 years, uh, the first in 96, uh, there was one manager for every 13.7 workers. 20 years later, we're down to 5.8 uh, workers for every manager. Um, did I get it right round, round the right way the first time? Anyway, I think you can see what's going on. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, the electricity sector uh, has, has, has got the problem of too many chiefs and uh, not enough Indians. But while, <clears throat> while the managers increased by 217%, the sales workers, uh, now I've defined that fairly broadly to include marketing managers through to um, uh, people that do the phone calls, uh, the cold calling. But sales workers increased by 396%, uh, a massive increase. And, you know, remember we're talking about electricity. You don't have to sell electricity to Australians. Um, <clears throat> unless you privatize the thing and uh, you've got all these companies uh, fighting over a base that's not going to increase. As they increase their sales effort, it's all cannibalizing each other. Um, <clears throat> uh, but in the meantime, that's uh, had the effect of uh, increasing the cost base of uh, electricity in Australia. And I mentioned AGL's figure of uh, $96 per customer. Uh, they're not the only ones that have employed more sales workers and increased that dramatically. Uh, but they're at least you know, one organization that describes um, or gives us the cost for what's going on there. Um, <clears throat> now, I've uh, perhaps gone over my 20 minutes, but um, <clears throat> the, the other main thing I'd like to point out, the poles and wires have not been immune to this process even though a lot of them remain in the public sector. We've had the non national competition policy, which um, 
uh, <clears throat> has asked them to corporatize and pursue a rate of return on capital equivalent to um, their peers in the private sector. Uh, and the effect of that has been to dramatically increase the amount that we as consumers pay for those, uh, those services. Um, <clears throat> the, the idea that the government uh, enterprises should pay or earn the same sorts of rates of return as their peers in the private sector uh, is pretty curious, I think. Um, <clears throat> I remember once we gave evidence about the ripoffs in banking and uh, <clears throat> uh, during cross-examination in, in the Senate inquiry looking into this, uh, <clears throat> we were asked, well, uh, the, the big four banks in Australia don't seem to be making uh, profits all that much more, all that much higher than their peers in the top 20 companies in Australia. And we're able to point out that if you make that comparison, you're making a comparison with, I think at the time it was five big mining companies, all of which all of which have a monopoly over their particular deposit. And we were, you know, talking about not the full boom, but the aftermath of the resources boom when prices are still very high. Plus you're talking about the retail duopolies, Telstra, the monopoly, the insurance giants, Westfield, all that sort of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> but here we have um, <clears throat> arguments in the, the electricity sector that say uh, our state enterprises uh, for efficiency reasons should be earning the same rates of return as uh, the top end of town in Australia. Um, David, um, sorry, Jeff here. It's pro probably time to start drawing to close. Um, soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, there's a lot of yeah, <clears throat> other interesting things you can say about all this, uh, but I think I've made the main points that I want to make. Um, <clears throat> but what we're looking at is basically a huge ripoff as a result of privatisation. So thanks for giving me the opportunity. That's great, David. Thanks. And uh... Yeah, you've confirmed what uh, what we all thought, <laughs> and you've really, um, really sort of given us the detail um, about uh, you know and, and the facts and figures of it, which is has been really interesting. Um, we, we're going to move to the um, question and answer now, and uh, in, in a little while, I'm just going to invite a member of our team, Jarno, to to um, nominate a questioner, um, but. I'm actually going to take the privilege of um, asking the first question this time. Um, and particularly, um, the, I'm intrigued by a couple of points um, that John Quiggin was making that the tide he, he is really turning on privatization. Um, and that's one point. And another point being that the, the Victoria seems to be the exception. Although Victoria, in Victoria, we have the socialist left in power. Um, and of course, privatization was kind of kicked off in Australia by the Labour Party. It's being rolled back in Britain um, under a, the Conservative Party at the moment. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, for the question for the two of you, um, how much of this ebbing and flowing of the tide of privatization is being driven by the sort of political forces of the left and the right, 
or how much is it just something which seems to have its own logic? Uh, yeah, so I'll jump in. I mean, looking at the Queensland picture, uh, what we saw, um, yeah, what we saw uh, with the Bly Labor government was having been elected just after the global financial crisis on a promise of large scale public intervention. Uh, they then very suddenly discovered the need to privatise all sorts of assets. There's a backstory about um, a lead finance guy in the place who'd been there for decades who was deeply attached to the AAA rating. But anyway, they went ahead, uh, sold the assets, uh, were reduced at the next election to seven seats in Parliament. Uh, mm. The LNP got in, uh, although they broke a bunch of other promises, they, to give them credit, they said, well, we won't privatise any assets until we've, we have a mandate to do that. Went to the public with uh, a, a, um, a privatisation program. In both cases, an expensively publicly funded PR campaign. Uh, they were promptly crushed and now neither side will touch it. And I think... Uh, so my perception is, uh, my perception is that this is much more a case of uh, a case of the evolution of ideas and cohort replacement than it is a situation where uh, over the past thirty years there, there have been uh, radical differences between the two parties. We went from a bipartisan and generally elite consensus in favour of privatisation, which emerged in the early eighties and really persisted right through. Uh, up to the global financial crisis and a few years after that. Uh, uh, initially, well, I think some degree of public tolerance. I mean, there are plenty of problems with the government business enterprise. It's easy to tell the story that the private sector would do a better job. It was only when people had experienced that they changed. So, yes, yeah, so I don't really think uh, uh, India, I don't really think that the group that calls itself the socialist left has been notably different. I mean, Anna Bly was certainly a member of the socialist left and for all I know, still combines that with her role as head of the Australian Bankers Association. Uh, uh, she, I, I haven't, I'm not aware of whether she's ever uh, left the Labour Party or left that faction. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so yeah, so I think uh, there's certainly a group that has that name and there's another group that's called the Liberal Party. And I, you know, these names expecting groups Expecting those groups to comply with those names is, is pretty much like expecting you know, the Richmond Tigers to be made up of four-legged animals with stripes. I mean, the names bear very little relationship to uh, any actual position on policy. Thanks, John. D David, do you have a comment on this? Yes, I, uh, I agree with everything John's said. But now we're in a position where the things left that we might be talking about are the post office and uh, other, other very awkward things. Uh, <clears throat> we're really down to the core of the public sector, especially at the Commonwealth level. And, and John, John's dead right. And even the mining council, uh, when Peter Costello recommended that the Gladstone port be privatized, uh, they fought a furious battle against that because they'd had the experience of the privatization of Dalrymple Bay, uh, <clears throat> where you, you sell something off to a lazy monopolist who uh, don't care if there's enough capacity in the port, don't care if there's a dozen ships waiting to get in, you know, mooring offshore, uh, so <clears throat> I think there's those, those two factors, the, the very bad experience, but also the fact that there's not much left to sell. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thanks for that. I mean, it's interesting because obviously, I mean, I think as John said, he'd like to see us campaigning for a kind of, I think this is what he said, John, a sort of systematic um, sort of rolling back of privatization, but so far, it hasn't happened. People have asked in the chat, you know, what about our socialist objective and so on in the Fabians, but at the moment, that's not happening either, um, in my perception anyway. Um, so um, I'm just going to invite Jarno to come in and say who's going to be our next questioner, Jarno. Uh, 
Uh, hi there. Um, so I think we'll uh, call on um, Tim Diamond to pose uh, his question on, uh, I think it was public-private partnerships and uh, industry super funds. Tim, you there? Uh, yeah, thanks. I think you almost asked my question, but mm -hmm. I'll uh, basically just really a question to John or either of them that uh, public-private partnerships are sometimes sold on the basis that, uh, or sold to the public, on the basis that uh, industry super funds can get involved. And uh, because industry super funds have union involvement and have uh, notionally at least sort of so social objectives, that somehow privatisation in that sense is sort of less bad. So I was just wondering uh, what the speakers uh, thought of that proposition. I really think it's more magic pudding stuff. Um, I mean, yeah, if we look at the if we look at the if we look at the question, um, if we said, look, what we want to do is, if we said, said well, what that social objective means, it means that um, means that these funds will be willing to accept a lower rate of return on their investments uh, because the investments are doing good things for Australia. Uh, you know, if that was spelled out. I imagine the appeal of that proposition would drop away very, very fast. Um, uh, the, um, if we said, yeah, and indeed, I mean, we, we do have the fundamental problem that we have a retirement income system built on rates of return that are going to be very, very difficult to uh, sustain in the future on any basis. But certainly, uh, certainly, if we are on the one hand selling a superannuation policy that says we can generate enough rates of return to give people a comfortable retirement, on the other hand, saying this will provide cheap capital to bring down the cost of electricity, I think we, um, we're in a bit difficulty. Yes, and in fact, the, uh, the super funds are targeting 10% plus when they get into these investments. And these are investments that have already got that goodwill premium. Uh, so, you know, the super funds are buying in uh, when the capital value is inflated and these uh, infrastructure assets um, <clears throat> are generating very high returns so that yeah, the, the effect of that is to make it politically harder uh, to actually address some of these ripoffs. So that's the quandary. Yes, it's more, more friendly capital, if you like, uh, <clears throat> but <clears throat> uh, once again, you're putting this floor under uh, the prices we we pay, and uh, it's, it becomes the the equivalent of a private GST. Coming so slightly back on a later point, uh, because it comes to all these issues of regulation. In some sense, even with goodwill, there is no way to manifest that goodwill. The whole setup is. Yes is to tell the uh, tell the privatised firms, make as much money as you can subject to the regulation. Now you can say, well, uh, good quality capital won't actually won't actually seek to defraud the public in the way that you know, say Macquarie Bank would. Um, but but there's no way that there's no way that the setup says um, uh, we're going to encourage you to not, yeah, you know, to be kind to your workers and not lay them off the moment it becomes profitable to do so. Uh, the whole setup is designed precisely to ensure that that doesn't happen. That uh, that the only constraints on profit maximisation are those that are explicit in the regulatory framework. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So I'm going to um, pick someone, and jo John and I can do the double act tonight, but. Um, Susan Hogan, you've asked a number of questions and uh, made a number of comments in the chat. Earlier on, you talked about uh, a comparison between WA and the East. Um, so um, I don't know if you'd like to ask a question about that or anyway, you have the floor. Susan Hogan, unmute. Oh, thank you for that. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, my question about the WA experience was that I understand it's not a part of the NEM, and it's still 
sort of in government hands. Uh, and I was wondering what, how that compares with the East Coast um, and the various, well, the various corporatized ownership structures, but the NEM that we have on the East Coast. And I mean that in terms of how it's reflected for a consumer experience. Right, does that one, David? I think you do. Um, my understanding is that uh, while it's not part of an NEM, uh, they've still sort of adopted the corporatization type agenda uh, <clears throat> that national competition policy sort of stuff. So that for all intents and purposes, they tend to act like a private corporation these days. Uh, I may be wrong and maybe you can distinguish that, uh, that those companies from the more rapacious AGLs and origins uh, but uh, yeah, my impression is there's probably not a lot of difference. Just jumping in with Queensland, which I do know more about, it's all uh, it's publicly owned there, and I think what you can see is, and although the formalisations have changed, as somebody who's a regulator, we've gone from a phase when a phase when the privatised, uh, sorry, corporatised distribution companies were very gung ho, uh, seeking to maximise profits uh, in ways that turned out to be thoroughly irresponsible, uh, to a situation where uh, they're much, they've been pushed back somewhat towards the old statutory authority model, where uh, the minister will say, I really think you should do this and they have to pay attention to it. Um, so, so that, yeah, that, I mean, that's. Just, I think, simply reflects the fact that although the structures haven't changed, no one any, any longer believes in the in the corporatised model in the way they used to. It. It's, it's there, but the idea of the idea is that the minister gave them a call and said, "We're doing the wrong thing here." The idea of them getting up, well, as Christine Holgate tried to do, indeed, of saying, "Well, look, you know, you're only the shareholder here. We're the company. Yeah. Um, uh, we don't do this anymore." Uh, yeah, that, that no one, yeah, the, the, I mean, although in important respects, this and hold out was unfairly treated over the watches. I think what you go in was, was the notion of, well, this isn't the public's money. This is you know, Australia Post Limited's money, and we're a corporation, uh, we're a separate corporation that has, you know, its only thing is it happens to have government shareholders. That kind of belief is out. Uh, and, and, so, and so we've seen, I think, as a result, uh, somewhat better outcomes in Queensland recently. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that question and those answers. So, Jano, um, do you like to go next for someone? Who should we hear from next? Oh uh, yeah, sure thing. Um, David Scott just asked an interesting question in the in the chat, and um, uh, the question is: Are the faults mentioned in the energy privatisation experience due to bad design or inappropriate? privatization and other examples of good PPP slash privatization? Um, taking the second one first, I mean, there's, there were some easy examples early on. There was stuff that would end up in the public sector that had no reason to be there. Um, yeah, the Whitlam government, for example, uh, in some fit of enthusiasm, bought a shopping mall in, in Belcon and yes, yeah, in Canberra. And there was no, I mean, that was, I suppose, a uh, an exercise in dogmatic nationalisation. They got rid of it. No one's ever, ever suggested getting back into shopping mall business. Again, I mean, going back even further, the Queensland government used to own butcher shops. Um, I think you could add, for example, uh, Qantas, you know, it was sold off. Uh, hasn't, you know, there have been ups and downs with Qantas, but the, but the notion that a country, you know, once we got past the notion which Qantas still tries to exploit that we need a national flag carrier, and just said, look, we don't, you know, all we need is people to fly planes. We don't have, you know, there's no reason why one of them should have, one of them should be the Australian company and others different. Uh, that made good sense. PPPs, in an important sense, you can't avoid PPPs. I mean, you know, if we, if we say want to build a road, uh, yeah, for small stuff, maybe the council will have, have, a, have its own labourers build it, but most of the time there'll be a contract to build it. The issue is really whether 
we've got a significant improvement in moving from uh, traditional procurement, which is we go out and say to somebody, you build the road, you, know, you put in a build, fit to build the road, build it, we'll check quality. If it's okay, we'll pay you, and that, that'll be that to, to the long to the PVP type contracts. Um, very yeah. hard to find, I think, good examples where good examples where that that model works simply because there really isn't often a link between construction and operation. Um, the fact that somebody's good at building a hospital doesn't mean they'll be good, good at running it. And if you say, well, we're going to fix that by having, again, Macquarie Bank put together a building company and an operations company themselves taking 15% off the top at every point, uh, that's really where it's. So I think, I don't think there's any merit really in the PPP model as we've seen it in the last 20 years. Right, I'm, I'm going to step in and I'm actually going to a couple, uh, ask a question that um, I think has come up in different ways in the chat. Uh, there have been a few people that have asked about um, regulation, you know, failures and successes in regulation, failures and successes in the way the government actually contracts with the private sector. And, and I'd like to ask, does that really make a difference? Um, you know, do we see that? really good regulation, really good contracting with the private sector really delivers a difference or is the model itself just really the determinant of how, how well things or badly things work? Um, so I think, as I just mentioned, I mean, mm. in an economy with a private and public sector, we have to have contracting. So, so those things have to exist. The problem I think is when we talk about the regulatory model, it's designed with a corporate, you know, uh, it's designed with a bunch of assumptions in mind, which typically haven't worked. And you know, going back you know, to the early stage of privatization in the UK, not only was, not only was it designed, you know, obviously designed to operate uh, in the idea that we have a profit maximizing firm and subject to justice and constraints, but also that somehow competition would magically emerge and, um, and make this unnecessary. So for example, when they said, what should we do about prices? The original answer was, look, we'll just say CPI minus X. You have to reduce your, you can't increase your prices by more than, you have to cut 1% off the CPI. And it's obvious that couldn't last indefinitely, that either it'll be too high or too low. But the assumption was we only have to do this once, maybe five years, and after that, the market will sort things out. So I think, um, I think the question is really, is there a system of regulation that works with monopoly type enterprises, yeah, which is the main one, ones of interest, uh, where those enterprises are seeking maximise profits? And I think the answer is there isn't. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> it's a very, very hard one. And we remember that Milton Friedman and capitalism and freedom uh, said, you know, with a public, with a, yeah, <clears throat> public utility, you tend to have three options, <clears throat> private monopoly, uh, public monopoly, or regulated private monopoly. And he said the least evil uh, was public ownership. Uh, but getting back to the point about regulation, um, <clears throat> we do have some good examples in Australia and uh, one of them in particular is uh, the new regulatory environment for Facebook and Google. Uh, something that makes a lot of sense and addresses uh, the, the exact problem that uh, Google and Facebook pose in Australia, uh, being able to uh, pick off content and make it freely available to everybody, uh, which undercuts the business model of uh, traditional uh, news gatherers and disseminators. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but uh, I fear that really that with the public ownership, the desirable point we'd like to get back to uh, and we, John's right, we, we, we see glimpses in 
in South Australia and the Snowy 2.0, where the government has had to get back into some of these industries. Uh, but <clears throat> the horse has bolted, really, to, to buy back uh, the electricity sector in Australia, for example, uh, given the present you know, monopoly profits being earned there, would just be horrendous. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in and say I, I don't agree with that at all. I think uh, the first thing is the monopoly profits are the product of regulation. Mm. So um, we yeah. could, without violating any constitutional prohibitions, we could first scale down the monopoly profits and then buy them back with money at 2%. So no, I, I think, and indeed, given the government's paranoia about China, uh, starting with the large Chinese-owned transmission, you know, on the one hand, they say university professors ought to be very careful any time they talk to somebody from China. On the other hand, it's fine to have our electricity transmission network owned by the Chinese government. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah. I think, I think uh, in terms of the politics of it, um, uh, we can and should buy back uh, most of monopoly assets, including transmission and distribution. Well, if there was political will for that, sure. Uh, well, I mean, I, I've been. I mean, I, I, I mean, obviously there isn't, but I suppose that's what the purpose of um, the purpose of a body like the Fabians presumably is. Yep, talking my language, John. Certainly, um, yeah. As you say, it, it can be done at virtually no cost, really. In the end, um, I'm going but to an yeah. another interesting. Can I just jump in again? Another interesting question, though, would be. <clears throat> okay, if we have a, uh, an agenda of uh, renationalizing, where will we start? Will we start with electricity or nursing homes? Um, um, I, I, yeah, I would, well, I would certainly start with electricity because it's easy. I mean, it's, um, I mean, nursing homes, I think, is. Um, yeah, I would start with electricity because I mean it's simply, I mean it's large bucks, but I mean I mean we could do that. Essentially, if the government shows, um, yeah, they could just say, well, here's our offer and here's our alternative. Here's our alternative offer. Um, we could do it quickly, and and we would have instant policy benefits in terms of fixing or oh, getting rid of large parts of the, of the NEM, which would cease, cease to be relevant with, uh, yeah, with. A non-corporatized. Uh, yeah, if we had a public grid, we, we could get rid of most of the NEM uh, and replace it with something that works. So that's where I would start. Uh, I think. Uh, well, I'll, I'll vote for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, I'm just saying. I mean, I mean, clearly the nursing home thing is a mess. But it's a mess that's going to take a long while to unwind. Mm -hmm. uh, that was discussed last week, so maybe people have a different view then. Yeah. <laughs> As you say, that requires political will, which we don't seem to have at the moment. Um, yeah, John Thompson, uh, you are now going to get your moment. Thank you. Uh, look, um, the electricity stuff is is really quite interesting. Kennett was persuaded before the uh, the election to which he came in power by the IPA and the Tasman Institute. And they produced a whole privatisation of Victoria's power system, the transport system, the ports, the water, and so on. Yeah. And the electricity was first off the first off the back, uh, from, off the mark. He sold. We ended up with the generators, all in foreign in Victoria, all in foreign ownership. We ended up with the transmission line being the transmission network in Victoria, owned by the Chinese and Singapore consortium. Yeah. We've, we've ended up, that's Osnet. We ended up with the five distribution companies, all of them foreign owned, and our 27 retailers in this state, three quarters of them are owned by foreign companies. We, we've, in addition to 
all of the sorts of things that John and David were talking about in terms of marketing people, HR people, and God knows what else in all of those companies who are all incidentally um, non-taxpayers because they're able to write off their uh, hmm. expenses and or repatriate it to the government of China or to Singapore or wherever else they've come from. Um, in addition to that, we also have a whole slew of regulators and officers that uh, are required to make the system work. So we've got AEMO in uh, running it. We've got the National Energy Regulator trying to run it. We've got the State Commonwealth uh, Council on Energy involved in it. I mean, we've, in addition to all of the overheads of each of the companies at all of those levels, that's generating transmission, distribution, and retailing, in addition to that, we've got a whole slew of government agencies that are required to try to make the system work. And it's just not working. Now we're getting moving into the renewable stage and we're getting in Victoria, I've, thought, I've done some work on the wind farms that have uh, begun operating in Victoria. China, again, has 40% of the generating power, and that's the China state grid, has 40% of yeah. the output of the new wind farms. Spain is next, and then a slew of others. And Australia has, I think, it, I can't remember the figures offhand, it's well down the list. Now, the, the, the system has gone mad. Uh, <laughs> really, it's a, it, I would agree with John Quiggan that we're really, we're really not doing it right at the moment. Now, oh, Western... was, there a, was there a question, sorry, just to kind of bring your attention to, to oh. obviously... Um, right. You know, giving you an opportunity to ask a question and anyone else a question. Did you have a question more directly? Oh, right. No, no, I, I'm responding. So that's okay. Sure. I'll, I'll be quiet. Yep. No, that's all right, John. We appreciate it. Yeah, well, yeah, no, no. Comment is good, but yes, so we, we have to sort of the, the time right. over there. Did, did John and David, do you, would you like to respond to that at all? I think John might have read my report to the <laughs> electricity, electrical trade team five years ago. I 100% agree with all of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and foreign investment uh, generally, you know, is a big sleeper in Australia, I think. Mm. Um, <clears throat> John, you've written on this and uh, how we get very little out of foreign investment. Uh, electricity is a mature industry. There's very little innovation. Uh, there's a need for a lot of wind, of course, that sort of stuff. But there's there's very little R and D or anything being carried on, and uh, if if you have a foreign takeover, it just means that um, you're going to have an income income flow on the current account of the balance of payments. Uh, <clears throat> you know the sort of stuff that the Vernon report warned us about in the '60s. Right. Th thanks for that. Now I think we will draw the Q and A to a close soon. Uh, but I'm just going to ask some of our, our team here in, in Victoria, we've got Jarno, Fernanda and, and um, Santino, whether, whether there's a question that you've seen in the chat or a question that we really should um, cover before we close the Q and A. Yeah, any of you want to jump in? Um, I suppose one of the questions that came through and it filtered through privately, but I think it is useful to, to come from some of these discussions is obviously we've suggested some of these, um, you know, kind of broader reforms and we've identified some of these issues that are existing that are quite endemic in the structures of the last 30 to 40 years increasingly have, have obviously come to dominate. Um, there's some things we can do that, that government can actually do in terms of legislation. I suppose we're very interested, I'm very interested, and I think more broadly people's comments have been, where you actually see this going. I mean, there was a hypothetical sense of, well, the electricity market is a good place to start, but where are some uh, kind of ways to start that 
you know, the public can be involved with or um, the, the politicians, it's more palatable for them to actually be engaged with what kind of things can actually take um, place from, I suppose, tomorrow? Where, where do you see this kind of going and where do you see people action perhaps contributing? Can I nominate NBN Co as a big sleeper? Uh, <clears throat> the, the government's talking about getting up to 100 billion for it. And um, <clears throat> uh, I looked at the half year report the other day and the equity in NBN Co is now worth minus $23 million. Uh, <clears throat> the thing is, the replacement value of MBNCO is zero with all that debt. <clears throat> and they're talking about raising a hundred billion for it. Now, what that has to mean is huge prices that flow in to everything from streaming serv services to 5G eventually. Um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> John made the point earlier that, you know, we didn't even need NBN Co had we not sold off Telstra in the first place. Uh, but here we are talking about selling off NBN Co and uh, the government's looking at huge bucks. This figure they quote of peak, uh, peak finance of around uh, 50 odd billion, uh, <clears throat> that's the amount they think they need to recover uh, given their earlier plans. Um, <clears throat> but even that is crazy stuff to sell for, for that sort of amount uh, would hugely inflate the cost to all of us. And just for interest too, uh, <clears throat> even though we tend to think of that area as, you know, mobile phones, internet, luxury sort of stuff. The bottom 20% spend around 2.5% of their income on this stuff. Uh, sorry, 2.5 times the share of the top 1%. So <clears throat> NBN Co, selling that off, would also impose a huge private GST on lower income earners. Sorry, I got into a bit of a rant there. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose I mean just following up on that, and I mean looking looking at the general political analysis, um, we start from where we are, and while we might not have the exact optimum risk mix of assets, uh, MBN Co is in the public sector. Yeah, and um, and so and although there's been a repeated expression that we're going to sell it, there's no reason why we should. And so, um, and rather we should refinance it with a 30 year debt at an interest rate of zero. Uh, yeah. and, um, and then gradually, um, yeah, then it doesn't need to make very much money to, to service it, to, to repay the, uh, repay the principal. Yeah, we need, we, it just needs to make enough money essentially to repay the principal that's been invested in it now. Thanks to the manifold, thanks to both the fact that we had to deal with Telstra and then we had Malcolm Turnbull's genius interventions. Uh, there's a loss there that can't be avoided. But, um, uh, so, but, yeah. but bygones uh, are bygones. Bygones are bygones. We could, yeah, certainly. So I think, I think uh, uh, campaigning against the sale of, of MBN has more prospects of success than campaigning for the renationalisation of transmission, although I would do both. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it's good to know we've got something we can get our teeth into um, on the left. Um, so I'm just going to again invite the rest of my team in Victoria, Jano, Santino and Fernanda, if there's um, a thing that we haven't really, really haven't dealt with, um, just speak up now. Otherwise, we'll, we'll sort of draw the Q&A to a close. No, I don't think so, Jeff. OK, so I think we might draw the Q&A to a close. Um, thanks to both of you. Um, I think this is really, I mean, it's been 
both of your your addresses were really interesting and i think the the discussion between the two of you and uh, and our fabian members on the call has been really interesting um and actually kind of to me i find it a little bit more hopeful than i i'm coming out of this a little bit more hopeful than i went into it that's my personal um feeling about it um so um i will close the q a um i'll just let you know that videos of this event and other events in the series are this event video will be on our website shortly and on facebook um, and videos of the previous event in this series and all our events uh, are on our fabian's um, website and our fabian's uh, youtube channel um, so that you can catch up with them on with them there um, and i'd like to hand over to julia thornton who's the chair of victorian branch uh, to close the meeting and tell you about the online pub Thanks very much, uh, Jeff. Um, 